You could be the greatest wrestler in the world. If you don't have that connection with the audience, you're just another guy. You still work for WWE? Yeah, still here. Do you think you could wrestle again? Looking at it from a medical point of view, it's safe, but given the opportunity to work as a producer, I'm quite happy doing this. Did you always want to be a pro wrestler? I wanted to be an NHL hockey player. Who was your guy growing up? I was a Hulkamaniac. What's something you learned from Kurt? The wrestling IQ. When to pick up the intensity and when to slow it down. How did you know it was time to move on from TNA? There wasn't anything left for me to do at TNA. There's still got to be one more match. You never know. I, I'm so excited that we're doing this. So thank you for finding the time. Of course. No problem. Of course. A fellow Canadian. Yeah. Proud of uh, the pride of Peterborough, Ontario. And I was telling you this when I saw you in Chicago for Survivor Series. Yeah. You live in Peterborough. I do. And you're you know, born and raised in Peterborough. Yeah. That was my first ever television market. Chex yeah. TV Crazy. in Peterborough. Yeah. And I lived in Pickering. So, you know, that's not close. Well, I mean, it's like now with like the 407, it's like 45 minutes, not even 45. So I so. was doing the 401 to the yeah. one, one, 35, 115. Yeah, that's something like a 25 minute it was, it drive. It was about, from, about an hour total. Hour. Total, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was because no one in Toronto would give me an internship. But this station was like, yeah, sure. You were dumb enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> dumb enough to put this guy on TV yeah, yeah, and do yeah, my we'll, start. We'll give you a chance. Yeah, no, it's crazy because uh, when he told me that, I was like, wow, Jax. Because I used to, like, I would go to my grandmother's house. My parents would have Jax news on every night. That's wild. And, uh, yeah, like, uh, Gary Dalladay was. Uh, oh, my gosh. The was, sports guy. Yeah. And this his is son, insane. His son, Pete Dalladay, yes. now is, has taken over his position. And he has a son that's my son's age. So it's like, a, yeah, like. Once you're a borough guy, you don't leave the borough. You know what I mean? It's just everybody kind of knows everybody. But it's ironic that you worked for Czech Television. I don't know how you still live in Peterborough and you're on the road as much as you are because you're yeah. not that close to the airport. I'm not. I'm, 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 well, like I said, with this new highway, this toll highway, which uh, toll highways aren't great, but it's a quicker drive and you're not on the 401, but I can get to the, to the airport in like an hour and 10 minutes. I guess that's not, you know, that's it's not, not horrible. No. And it beats be, uh, living in the city. You know, I'm not much of a big city guy, so. I don't know if people realize that you still work for WWE. Yeah. So I think. Still here. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I mean that with, with great love and great respect. Sure. When, when we're not seeing you perform, it's like, oh, wait, he's still doing something there. So you're yeah. working as a producer. I am. Yeah. I, uh, I had, uh, two neck surgeries. Um, I had my C5, C6 fused, uh, in November, uh, November 30th of 2022. Two, and then uh, May eleventh of twenty twenty three, my birthday. Uh, I had my level four and five fused, so I have a two level fusion. Was this just a nagging injury, or was there something that happened? A lot of wear and tear over the years. Yeah. Um, I can kind of relate it back to almost ten years to the day that I got re injured. Um, it was just a weird circumstance. I was in a match with Rob Van Dam, and just something happened. I don't know what it was. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't my fault. It was just something happened. Uh, and I just landed on the ground. Uh, you know, he does, he does that front suplex thing where he lands you on the, the barricade and then jumps off and does that twisting leg drop. And Rob and I worked together for a month at least on yeah. uh, doing live events, um, doing this exact same thing. And just so happened to happened to be on pay-per-view that this happened and my leg went numb for that felt like you know a minute and a half to two minutes it felt like my leg i did had no feeling in my leg but watching it back was more like 10 seconds but i had no feeling in my leg and then i ended up finishing the match uh and it, that was a ladder match finishing the match ended up uh wrestling the next day and the day after i think i want to say i wrestled aj on television um the next day and had like no issues. Yeah. Totally fine. And then I remember waking up that Friday that week and it felt like I had a golf ball in my back and I had no, I went to my cupboard to pull out a, a coffee mug to make coffee and my, I grabbed the coffee mug and my wrist just went like this. I had no strength and just like lost everything. And I thought oh, I was just, you know, I'll go to the gym and roll out and like work out. It'll be fine. Yeah. Like, just a stinger. And Man, I lost all kinds of strength. I lost a, a bunch of muscle and I had a lot of nerve damage in my neck. Um, but at that time, I just became world champion at TNA. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody I was hurt. And uh, different time, of course. Sure. But um, yeah, I worked through it. And miraculously enough, you know, I, I it kind of, the injury kind of repaired itself, so to speak, I guess, for 10 years. And 
was able to continue on and do what I've done. And, and then just I so happened to be in Amarillo, Texas in a match with Omos and just landed wrong and nobody's fault again. Just, you know, I think just the wear and tear over the years, um, just kind of my neck just said that was it. Do you think now that your next fuse that you could wrestle again? Ironically enough, I just got green lighted. Uh, the fusion has completely fused. So, uh, as far as like looking at it from, uh, you know, a medical point of view, uh, you know, it's safe to get back in the ring, I guess, but at almost 48 years old, um, given the opportunity that I've been given now to work as a producer, yeah. which was my goal, you know, coming to WWE almost eight years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm quite happy doing this and, and I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've had a, I've had a good run as they say. Um, and I'm happy to do what I'm doing now. But look, it's Royal Rumble weekend. Like you could hear that you could hear, we could hear glorious hit one more time. We could, but I don't think this is the year it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I can almost promise you that. Maybe next year. Well, this will be out after anyway, but yeah, maybe next year. You never know. I mean, yeah, sure. Like, could I do this full time? I, there's no way I could. I'm, I'm, and look, to be honest, the injury is, you know, I have three levels that are bad. You know, the, the level six and seven are not good either. So when I got my injury, um, back in 2022, when I, when I re-injured it, I got an MRI done the next day and like, you know, I mean, they said that, you know, your three levels are just not good. Mm. Two levels are not great. Um, you need to get fixed. So I went to Birmingham and, and saw Dr. Cordover, who's amazing. And, uh, he just, you know, thought we needed to do a two level. Cause the, the thing was, is that I wasn't living in any pain. I didn't have pain. Yeah. I, you know, I could go through the day without feeling any sort of pain that the issue with me was my strength. And then because I was losing strength, I started to lose muscle in my right arm. And it just scared me because I, the, the first thing I thought of was like Paul Orndorff, right. And his injury. And, uh, and that's what was happening to me. I was starting to atrophy really bad in my, in my shoulder, uh, and in my bicep. So long story short, I was set to get a two level fusion back in November, November 30th of 2022. And Dr. Cordover called me the night before, and I was in the hotel room in Birmingham, getting ready to get up at 5 AM the next day to get up and, and go to do the surgery. And he's like, talk to, you know, a couple of the doctors and, and. I think we can just get away with doing one level and I think you're going to be fine. So we went in and we did the one level and, you know, I felt great. You know, I not felt great the next day, yeah, but yeah. like, you know, after the six weeks of doing nothing and, and once I started the, you know, the, the physical therapy and, and all that other stuff, I, I felt pretty good. Like my strength was coming back and I, I felt like the muscle was coming back. And then just out of the blue, I remember March the 10th, I just remember having such wild pain that I never experienced before. And I don't know what happened. We really don't know what happened, but I remember getting really sick and vomiting and blacking out and then kind of coming to and not being able to like raise my arm up over my head. So oh. what happened was the level above it just went. So level four and five just kind of went wow. for whatever reason. So in hindsight, maybe we should have got them both done at the same time, but look, that's life and we just move on. But so I had to get this, this other fusion done and, um, you know, that level six and seven, like I said, is still not great. Um, but I'm feeling better. And so I just don't mentally, uh, I don't think I could take the risk going back in the ring and working a full-time schedule, just knowing that as well as, you know, I just, I feel like I look differently too. You know what I mean? I always kind of prided myself in the way that I, I, I looked on television and, sure. you know, um, I love being in the gym and working out and it's just, you know, when you physically don't look the same, it's just a, a mental thing as well for me. Quick time out from this conversation because I need to tell you about mud water. If you're a coffee drinker, listen up. Mud water is a coffee alternative with four functional mushrooms and only a fraction of the caffeine of a cup of coffee. You get natural energy without the jitters and without the crash of coffee. There's the ingredients right there on the side of the can. Yeah, no mud in mud water. It doesn't taste like mud either. It kind of tastes like a cacao and chai came together and had a baby. And the thing I love about it is it's all day energy. So you don't find yourself reaching for that second cup of coffee in the middle of the afternoon. And Mudwater is giving you $20 off when you subscribe at mudwater.com slash CVV. They're also going to throw in a free frother and a free coconut creamer, which is 
amazing. So go to mudwater.com slash CVV, that's M-U-D-W-T-R.com slash CVV to save $20 on your subscription. Probably want to have one last match though. I think everybody would like to have one last match, right? But sometimes you just, when the wheels fall off, the wheels fall off, yeah. you know? Um, it's just, that's the nature of the beast in this sport, in, in this industry. Well, if they were going to fall off anywhere, pretty good for them to fall off in WWE. 100%. And you to land on your feet with this job that you're super passionate about and that you're yeah. crushing. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like I said, that was kind of like the game plan when I came to WWE. You know, I, I had my conversation with, Triple H um, before coming to NXT. And, you know, at that time I was almost 40. You know, so I remember him, uh, I was on a three way call with him and Matt Bloom. And I remember him asking me, he said, like, so what do you want to do? Do you like, do you want to, you want to come here and coach? You know, do you want to be a coach? And I'm like, well, maybe one day, like, that's my goal. But I, I feel like I had a lot left in the tank. Yeah. He gave me that opportunity, which I'm super grateful for. And, you know, you know, here I am today. You know, I had a pretty good run in NXT and then had a, pretty good run on the main roster and and you know it is what it is you know like i said when the wheels fall off the wheels fall off and everything before that too and i actually don't know where to start with your career right. but let's start way back sure did you always want to be a pro wrestler i wanted to be an nhl hockey player <laughs> that's yeah. spoken like someone who's from peterborough yeah. ontario so yeah. like you know as you know being canadian yeah. from pickering it's like when you learn to walk, you learn to skate. Yeah. So I started like my dad had me on skates when I was three, you know, pushing the 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 steel chair on the on the ice and you're kinda of walking, you know, learning to skate and then playing hockey at four. Yeah. You know, and then watching hockey night in Canada every Saturday with my dad watching the Leafs. Don Cherry. Don Cherry and, and Ron McLean. You've and got like, the Peterborough Peets right Peterborough there. Peets, yeah. And I was a uh, crazy story. I was like a stick I was a stick boy for the Peterborough Peets when I was in grade seven, grade eight. So that's a minor league team for everybody in the OHL, the Ontario yeah, Hockey the, League. Yeah, it's like, if, yeah, you basically get drafted to the NHL. Yeah. I, I I was the stick boy the year that Ty Domi played there. Wow. Uh, Mike Ricci was there. Uh, I I stopped, I think, right before Chris Pronger, but a lot of great hockey players. Like, I just, I lived at the rink. I was a rink rat. Like, I just, I lived two blocks away from the arena. I grew up two blocks away from the arena. So every day I would just be there oh, at the man. arena. And I would... You know, I remember one day watching Steve Eiserman actually lived a block away from me. Like, and he lived right around the corner from the arena. He would billeted there. And I remember one day seeing Steve Eiserman walking to the rink and I was like, I mean, I fell in love with Steve Eiserman. He was like, he's my favorite hockey player of all time. I have his jersey hanging up in my, in my uh, man cave, wow. in my house. But anyways, yeah, I just, I grew up wanting to be an NHL hockey player. But as far as, you know, the wrestling business, I... I was alive when the very first WrestleMania happened and I watched it on closed circuit television in my uncle's bar in a little private room and watched the episode of Saturday Night Live with Hogan and, and Mr. T the night before, you know, staying up late. I was eight years old and I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I knew like one day if I wasn't going to play hockey or be a pro athlete, I this is what I was going to do. Were you ever close to playing pro hockey? <laughs> No, I mean, I look at, I played, uh, so travel hockey, like okay, AAA hockey, good. like I played for the Pete's and they all throughout, you know, up until my midget year, my draft year. And, um, we didn't have a great team. I ended up going in a different direction and playing high school hockey, which was still really good hockey, uh, played on some really good teams and won some championships. Um, but then I played one year of tier two junior A. Uh, and then at that point I was 19 and then I was like, nope, I'm not going to be going anywhere here. So it's time to get into wrestling. And that's what I did. Who was your guy growing up? For wrestling? Yeah. If Steve Eiserman was your hockey player, who was your wrestler? Well, of course, you know, the era that I came up in, I was a Hulkamaniac, of course. But and then once, crazy that you worked with him all those years later. Yeah, right? Yeah, I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was a Hulkamaniac. And then, but ultimately, like, my, of course, Brett, Bret Hart being Canadian, but my all-time favorite, uh, and I, you know, I'll say this to the day I die, the, one of the, the greatest performer anyways, Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning. Mm. He was the reason why I got in the business. Wow. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it wasn't easy at that time as a Canadian yeah. to break in, to do this for a living. The indie scene anywhere wasn't what it was then, no. like it is now. Uh, how did you even get noticed? Well, I broke in with 
uh, Sean Morley. So Val Venus. Yeah. Uh, broke in with him. He lived, we trained at the same gym, kind of became friends. And I actually broke in uh, in his backyard. He had a, a, a ring set up in his backyard uh, in 1996. So uh, broke in a little bit there and then kind of got away from it because he obviously went on to bigger and better things. He spent most of his time in Mexico and Japan and, and Puerto Rico and right before he came to WWE in like 98 or 97. And then in 98, um, I started training with him a little bit. We reconnected and uh, he got me in touch with Shane Sewell, who was his tag team partner in Puerto Rico. They were the Glamour Boys. And Shane lived in Peterborough. He owned a restaurant at the time. And uh, we drove two and a half hours to Hamilton every weekend for about six or seven weeks. And he uh, just one-on-one -on -one trained with him, you know, Saturdays and Sundays. And before I knew it, I was in my first match, June 20th of 1998. And I feel like with everything that was going on, after WCW went under and ECW went under, TNA starts up. Mm -hmm. The timing was just so perfect. Timing is everything in this business. I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> sure. But it, for my career, timing absolutely was everything. And you going into TNA at that point in time and spending the amount of time that you spent there, but like you yeah. going into TNA at that point in time, it was like right place, right time. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. And it, it was just by fluke. You know, I was doing a ton of enhancement matches and dark matches and um, stuff for WWE, right? From 99, I was like a year in the business and I started like coming to do, I remember I wrestled Perry Saturn on a, on a heat taping or a Saturday night, whatever it was. It wasn't velocity, but it was shotgun, like, right? Shotgun or something. Metal? Yeah. I, and it maybe, maybe, yeah. but uh, it was at the point he was with Terry Reynolds was his valet. Yeah. And I, I, here I was like, wrestling Perry Saturn like a year into the business. How did all that not lead to you getting hired by WWE? Uh, a lot of things, I guess. Just, um, and look, this is not a bad thing because I, I appreciate them telling me I, I, was, I was a good hand. I, they just creatively never had anything for me. I was also Canadian. So it was, you know, I needed to get uh, a proper visa. Yeah. And then back then, you know, look, I, I, I'm six foot and, you know, 225. Back in the Attitude Era, <laughs> I'm not a big dude. You know what I mean? Uh, Back then, like there was some giants and I just, I was a good hand and I could make guys look good and, and, you know, give, you know, I was a good enhancement guy, but I was never, I don't think, considered for, you know, a, a full-time job in, in WWE as a performer. I mean, we talked about a developmental contract. I did a developmental, um, uh, I guess it was like a camp in Cincinnati. And I did quite well there. Dr. Tom ran it and, uh, you know, everything was pointing towards me being hired finally in 2002, I believe it was. And then Cincinnati ended up closing down. HWA closed down. It was one of the uh, developmental territories for WWE. It was HWA and OVW. So when I finished that camp, I went home thinking I'm going to get signed. Yeah. A week later, they shut it down. And fired a bunch of guys and moved the guys that they kept to OVW and just, again, just never uh, got hired, but kept coming back and kept showing my face and doing these enhancement and dark matches um, for the next two years until 2004. Okay, a big thank you to our sponsor, NordVPN, and I do not log on to public Wi-Fi anywhere without NordVPN. Look, I think you know public Wi-Fi is notorious for being a hotbed for hackers to jump in there and steal your information, but NordVPN keeps me protected from hackers and gives me peace of mind while I'm traveling to do interviews like this one. It's incredibly easy to set up on your phone or your computer, and it is super fast. Now. The best part about NordVPN is accessing content from 59 different countries just by changing your virtual location. So if there's content that doesn't exist in the country that you live in, <laughs> oh, now it does when you change your virtual location. WWE Network is a prime example of that. If you just change your location to a spot where the WWE Network still does exist, you get that OG WWE Network experience. Pay-per-views, for example, maybe they're 40, 50, $60 where you live, Change your virtual location to a spot where they cost a fraction of the cost and enjoy the savings, my friends. Check out this deal that NordVPN has going on when you go to nordvpn.com slash CVV as low as $2.91 a month and, and four months for free 
On top of that, this is a limited time deal, so take advantage of it while it's happening at nordvpn.com slash CVV. That's nordvpn.com slash CVV. But that was the best thing about TNA is it found a place for yeah. people like you when there really weren't, wasn't a lot of places. No, there wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, thankfully that came right with WCW gone. You know, there really wasn't, and the independent scene was not great. Yeah. You know, at that, at that time. So yeah, TNA came along at the perfect time for me. Where do you think the magic really started to happen for you and TNA? Um, you know, kind of immediately, to be honest, you know, um, Team Canada really kind of got over quickly. And I wasn't even supposed to be a part of the, I wasn't even a, the, a part of the original Team Canada. Teddy Hart, I took Teddy Hart's spot. You know, Teddy couldn't come back or something happened with Teddy. I don't know what it was, but I got a call from Scott Demore on a, I think it was like a Thursday and somebody like, can you get to Nashville next Wednesday? And I was like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And I went and then the rest is history. I was sent home with a contract and, um, became a part of team Canada and like TNA was just starting to take off yeah. in 2004. We ended up going to, um, getting, uh, I think it was a Fox, some sort of Fox. I can't remember the station, but we ended up doing getting away from the weekly pay-per-views eventually we ended up getting tvs so we would go to orlando we would do our our pay-per-views on wednesdays and then fly thursdays to orlando and shoot tv so things just started to take off when i got there the timing was impeccable do you remember the first time you saw a canadian destroyer yes i remember seeing pd do it for the first time yeah. and being like how is that even possible yeah and chris saban i think he, i mean he's probably told the story but it was all chris saban I mean, it was Chris Saban's idea. And Chris was like, I think he was the first one to take it. Because basically, you're just doing a backflip. Petey's just hanging on for dear life. I mean, but Petey got the credit, but it was the guys that were taking it that, uh, that really made it look good. It, but it's the idea that, like, it had never been done before. No, no. And, like, to do a move, even in that era, that had never been done before, yeah. that, that's unheard of to, yeah. to see something for the first time. It was, yeah. And I got to see it almost every night. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, Team Canada was a lot of fun. And then, you know, we kind of broke up and they kind of sent everybody on their own way. And then, um, yeah, I think the spark was when I kind of got off on my own and started wearing the robe and had the ballet yeah. and all that stuff. And yeah. I feel like there was, there was something about that. I, it was maybe a little bit of like old school kind Throwback, of. Throwback, definitely. Yeah. And that's what I was going for. For sure. And it was, yeah. it was, it was so great. Cause it was yeah. like, we knew how talented you were in team Canada. Yeah. But then you went off and did your own thing and it was like, oh yeah, well now we can say. Right. Yeah. So I think that was like the, the taking off point for sure. I interviewed Moose recently, who's yeah. the TNA world champion right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, who's on your TNA Mount Rushmore? And he, let me see if I can get it right. Oh my goodness. So he was like, AJ, of course. Mm -hmm. Jared, cause Jared started it. Abyss and Kurt Angle. Yep. And so many people were like, I got to put Bobby Roode on there. And think about the time that you spent in TNA. Yeah. All of the things you did before Josh Alexander broke your record. You were the longest reigning TNA I was. champ. Yeah, I was. And that was uh, a crazy I spent 12 years there. Yeah. You know, um, and that time kind of flew by. I got to be in the ring with and learn from a lot of, I mean, Kurt Angle. I learned so much from him. And when those guys started to kind of trickle in and, you know, Kurt came in first, I think in 2006, but even learning like, you know, as a part of Team Canada, getting to wrestle with uh, BG James, Road Dog, mm -hmm. and Conan, and our truth like we had great chemistry together and just learning from those guys and, um, you know, eventually, like I said, learning from Kurt and then Booker came in, you know, and then, you know, we had Jeff Hardy and, and Rob Van Dam, uh, Kevin Nash. T. Yeah. Uh, just Sting, a, yeah. Yeah, Hogan, Sting. Like, just, yeah. yeah. And then the Hogan era, of course, in 2010 came in, and that, that all changed again. And getting a chance to to work with Ric Flair. You know, Rick was, like, our manager, you know, when we were running in the Fortune uh, the fortune deal with me, Kazarian, AJ, and James Storm. Yeah, when you, That was just, without, I mean, it was just surreal, you know what I mean? But you just, it was just like, you go to work and do your thing. But. Like looking back on it, it's like, well, I get to, you know, I work with Hulk Hogan. I got to work with Ric Flair. I got to work with Sting. Like those are some pretty huge names that I grew up watching, you know? Yeah. When you look at the highlights of TNA, especially like the golden years, if you will, of yeah. TNA, you're either there or you're adjacent to all of these yeah. like massive moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty crazy when you, when you think about it. Yeah, definitely.
Whose idea was it to pair you up with James Storm and form Beer Money? Dutch Mantel. Yeah, Dutch was uh, pretty instrumental in that. And Jeff Jarrett, too. I mean, Jeff, look, Jeff, if it wasn't for Jeff, I don't think I'd be here, you know, doing this still. I mean, Jeff gave me the opportunity in TNA when nobody else really would. Um, so Jeff, I owe a lot to Jeff Jarrett. But it was Dutch that came up with the beer money thing. At the time, I was doing my singles run and James was doing his singles run. And uh, we were just kind of floating around, kind of mid-card guys. And um, they had an idea to put us together and just like a throwaway tag team match. And we just kind of had this something sparked there. I don't know. And Dutch saw it. And Dutch just, you know, once you're in Dutch's sights and, and, he's, and he likes something he sees, he just kind of, he kind of runs with it and makes it his baby. So, yeah, we were just... We were paired together, and I remember, uh, I, I think we had a match. Some it was Again, we weren't beer money yet, and uh, we had a match, and we did a, a backstage promo right after, and uh, I think it was Vince Russo that wrote it, but it was, it, the, I think the end line was something to the effect of the two things that make the world go round was beer and money, because I was like the Wall Street, you know, guy, yeah. and, and James was this, the beer-drinking cowboy, and we just said, like, Two things that make the world go around are beer and money. And then it was like a light bulb went off and we we're off to the races. What was your friendship like with him before you guys got paired together? Just, I mean, honestly, we were just working no different than, uh, the closest friend I had there was Eric Young. You know, Eric and I, we traveled everywhere together and stayed together and like, we were like husband and wives on, <laughs> on the road. But James and I, I mean, we were just, you know, business associates really it just you know we never really hung out together we never drove together we never really did a lot of things together but just when we came to business and we we just went out and we did business that's amazing that you could yeah. have the chemistry that you guys had when you're just really work friends if you will yeah and that's all it was and we just you know we knew what we had you know what i mean we knew what we had in the ring and and he was a super talented performer and and we just kind of gelled together it was like oil and you know uh, the the characters were like oil and water, yeah. two totally yeah, different. Yeah. But that's what makes tag teams work. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, yeah, we just knew that the chemistry that we had, we knew what we had, and we just ran with it. Well, how different was it wrestling in the six sided ring? People ask me that all the time, and I don't have a good answer because I never really knew the difference, except it was a little bit harder to fall on, <laughs> and the ropes were a little tighter. I've heard that. I didn't find them any tighter. Okay. I don't know. Um, I've also heard guys say it was harder to go off the top rope, but I guess you're not doing that God, a lot. I, did, I don't do that. You know. <laughs> top rope. Don't, don't do that with that. Ropes. Like the, the yeah. angles different? The angles were definitely different. Yeah. yeah. So like, I remember like taking a superplex or whatever, you know, taking a move. It was definitely hard to get your footing and it was different, but it made our company, that company different. Oh, I was a big TNA fan. Yeah. I remember buying the best of AJ Styles DVD mm -hmm. part one and part yeah. two and wearing it out and watching yeah, every yeah. match on there. AJ's incredible. What do you think, like you said, you learned so much from Kurt. What's mm -hmm. something you learned from Kurt that we would see in your matches later on when you're in WWE? Just, I mean, I don't know if it was the match, just the, the, from the mental aspect, right? The, the wrestling IQ. Um, mm. Him and I had really good chemistry together. I loved working with Kurt. He was like one of my favorite opponents and. I remember one time, and, and this was not Kurt's, like, I guess, I guess it was his, like, first retirement tour. And it, this is when he was finishing up with TNA. And we were overseas, and he had three matches left. And he picked his opponents. And it was, I think it was Bobby Lashley, Drew McIntyre, Drew Galloway at the time, and myself. Mm. And uh, I was still a part of Beer Money, and Kurt and I were you know, obviously both baby faces. So we went out and had our match. And I remember getting to the back thinking, we never threw one punch throughout the entire like 15 minute match. I like, guess that's kind of unheard of, right? Like you, you, at least throughout a match, somebody's going to throw a punch. Yeah. And we just worked. Like it was just, there was something about Kurt that just, you know, you could just get in there and just feel it. And he would take you where he wanted you to go. Yeah. And just learning that, just the pacing of it and when to pick up the intensity and when to slow it down and when to like, feel the people and when when to kind of just change gears mm. he was a master at it and just just pick up on things like that you and i learned that from a lot of different guys what about aj because everybody you know when you talk about tna aj's the first person that people yep. talk about you had so many great matches with him mm -hmm. what's the thing you learned from aj <sighs> being a pro i mean aj's a pro 
Um, you know, he was just in tune with what he could do. And, you know, he obviously he could do, he's super athletic. Yeah. You know, one of the most athletic guys I've ever been in the ring with, but he knew that he didn't have to do that all the time. But when he needed to pull it out, he could pull it out and do it better than anybody else. You know, he was just, I don't know, you could just, he's just one of those guys that you just have, I don't think you could have a bad match with AJ Styles. You know, he's just that good. How much did TNA change in the Hogan Bischoff era? Like how much, and how much did you feel it? It definitely changed, you know, um, I don't know. It was, it was different for sure. And I can't really put a, a finger on what exactly changed, but I could just feel, and it was great for a while. It really was. And look, I can't really say anything bad about Eric Bischoff or Hulk Hogan. I, they've made me their champion and I had a really good run and, um, you know, but it was different for sure. It's just like this, the changing of the guard. I, I don't deal with change very well. <laughs> you know, and I think it's just, that's just the nature of the wrestling business. You know, that when change happens, people kind of freak out a little bit. Um, but yeah, I don't know what it was. I think it was like, it was okay for a while. It was good. And then I think just the kind of the wheels just kind of fell off and everybody just stopped caring. And I think there was too many cooks in the kitchen. Did you just show up to work one day and you're like, oh, there's a four sided ring now? Yeah. Really? Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, I, I heard rumblings of it, like, when Hogan and Bischoff came in, that they were going to switch back to the more traditional style, more traditional look. And, yeah, it was just one day you just walked in and the six-sided ring was gone and the traditional yeah, four-sided yeah. ring was there, yeah. yeah. And, and look, at it, it was just one of those things, okay. Yeah. Just going to work. Well, and then the, ma I mean, the match quality was still just as good yeah yep it was and and you know i don't know i guess to the viewer maybe people i obviously noticed because it was so unique the six-sided ring but um as a performer at least for me personally speaking i didn't notice much of a change give me your top three tna matches oh man top three like from a performance standpoint from just your favorite like Maybe it was a, a favorite storyline that culminated in a match. I mean, obviously winning the world championship. Yeah. That's, that was pretty, that's definitely on one of the top three. I don't know which one it would be, but. <laughs> yeah, they don't need to be in order. Yeah. And I mean, just, I don't know if there's any like particular matches. I think it's more for me. It's like just the story and, and the environment and where we're at. Like the matches I had with Sting, um, the matches I had with Kurt, obviously being in the ring with AJ. Um, but, you know, one of the, the most memorable times that I had was like a non tele no, nobody ever seen it except the people that were there in the audience in, in England. We were on a European tour and uh, Hogan was over there because I think we were shooting TV one of the nights, but Hulk came in uh, night one and we were doing just a live event. And uh, I think the match was supposed to be Sting I don't know what the match, maybe there were singles matches at the time. I, I had the title at the time. So I don't know if I had a championship match that night against Storm or what it was, but ultimately it ended up, we ended up doing a six man tag and it was myself, Bully Ray and Kurt Angle versus James Storm, Sting and Hulk Hogan. And we did that match every night. I think it was like a five or six night tour. That's and we did great. that, we did that match every night and we even did it like we shot TV. And then when we went dark, we did that match to finish, to end the night. Wow. So, and it's, it's still a part of history. I was a part of Hulk Hogan's last professional wrestling match. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and those, like, it's the moments, right? It's those moments you kind of look back on and go, wow, yeah, that's a pretty cool moment. Yeah. I mean, you had so many of those cool moments. Yeah. So many. Like, can you believe Sting's still wrestling? It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I, he has one more match left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next month as we sit here, but can, yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I'm happy for him. Yeah. He's had a incredible career. Yeah. And just such a good human being. How did you know it was time to move on from TNA? Just, I felt it, um, just from a personal standpoint and look, I owe everything to, you know, like I said, to, to Jeff and to TNA and, and it really put me on the map, but ultimately I grew up a WWE guy. You know, I watched, that's what I grew up. I watched WWF every Saturday and Sunday from the time I was eight years old to now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I didn't get a chance to watch any NWA stuff or Florida Championship Wrestling or, or, you know, 
any of that stuff because it was, you know, where I grew up, it was just WWF. I didn't get to see any of that other stuff until I actually got into the business and traded DVDs and, and stuff or, or VHS tapes even. So, you know, and look, I, from the moment I broke into the business, I, I did everything I could to be a part of the WWE, WWF back then, you know, doing the enhancement matches and the camps and the tryouts and I drove all over, you know, I, I flew myself to Calgary to, you know, to do an enhancement match. I was booked. They said, can you go to Calgary? And I was like, yep, no problem. You know, and I just got there. Yeah. Um, so ultimately like that was my goal was to be a part of the WWE. And, uh, I, I just, there wasn't anything left for me to do at TNA. You know, I, I saw guys like Samoa Joe, um, succeed in NXT. Uh, I saw AJ, you know, start to succeed in Japan guys that were with me and that I worked with throughout my career, starting in 2004, up until that point in 2015, 16, they were gone. And like, there was an influx of new guys coming in. And I mean, that's just the circle of, of life really with this business, right? And then new guys come in and old guys will, will leave. But I just felt like there was nothing else I could do. A two-time world champion, multiple time tag team champion. Um, you know, so I just knew that if I was going to go or at least, give the WWE a shot. Yeah. This was, this was the opportunity. This was the time. Um, like I said, I was almost 40. And you debuted the same year as AJ. Uh, right? yes, 26. I believe so. So he did the Royal Rumble. In, yeah. And like, I, I started in NXT, I believe, uh, that summer. Yes. Yeah. Same, I believe so. I mean, those are two big TNA stars. Yeah. Going over to WWE. Yeah. Your entrance theme got you over immediately. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, like it. True or false, this was originally supposed to be the theme song for Shinsuke Nakamura. I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. And I remember, um, I think you're right. I remember just being, uh, and it, the look, when I when I signed, I had no idea about this song, right? I We kind of talked, uh, we being Triple H, and I talked a little bit about like what I wanted to do and character-wise and what, where I was, what I was doing at TNA. And you know, the, I always like wearing the robes. I always like being like a throwback guy. Yeah. Not that I wanted to be Ric Flair, but I always just loved that look, yeah. you know? And I wanted to bring the robe back. And, um, you know, I was at NXT TV one day. This was before I debuted. And he's like, I want you to listen to this song. And, you know, listen to it. And it was like, eh, I don't know. What do you mean? Right? It was just, it was different, right? It wasn't like a traditional theme song. But then I was like, well, this, this is, might work with like the robe and like, if the presentation is right, this will, this will work. And the presentation was above and beyond what I ever imagined. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely that song changed my career really. And it's crazy to think about that because everything else could have been the same, the presentation, the wrestling, the, the gear, yeah. everything with a different song, your WWE run might've looked completely different. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, yeah, that song. I mean, people still talk about that song today. You know what I mean? My it's, friend entered to his wedding yes, to that song. I've seen a bunch of the, yeah, that's, that's, and that stuff is wild to me, right? <laughs> like, it's unbelievable when you, when you see, and I mean, I'm, I'm at a hockey game, you know, the Nashville Predators used it uh, for when they, after they won hockey games, they would play my song. What's the story behind that song? It was just a, a song that they, they created and they were waiting for the right person to give it to? I guess so, yeah. Wow. It was just kind of sitting there in the, in, the, in the library, apparently. And uh, yeah, I was just lucky enough to get it. And then it turned into, I loved it, what, what Johnny and Tommaso were doing with the Glorious Bombs. Yeah, yeah. And that made it even like more of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just did that as a joke. And the first one was such a hit that we just continued to continue to do them. It was... A, it was Whenever we had some downtime in, in NXT on the on the road shows, because we all traveled together on the bus, right? So yeah, we'd always think of uh, creative ideas, to, things to do. That song is like the epitome of what your character was, though. Like you could play that song for someone who's never watched wrestling before, and they'd go, "Oh yeah, I think I I understand what this guy's all about." Yeah. And then when you actually see what your entrance looked like, it's like, "Oh yeah, that's exactly what I envisioned." Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it's just a it's amazing how one little thing can change everything for you. Right. And that's the nature of sports entertainment, right? It's like you could be the greatest wrestler in the world. You know what I mean? Bell to bell. Yeah. But if you don't have that connection with the audience, you're just another guy. You had a, such a great run in NXT. And I, I loved it. I loved it. You put on some incredible matches there with some amazing opponents. And it was just like, 
I loved it because if someone hadn't watched TNA, it's like, yes, you get to see what Bobby Roode's all about. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was, I wasn't sure what to expect from NXT, to be honest with you. Because at the time, you know, I, I was going to, I'm going to be honest, I never watched it. You know what I mean? I was busy with TNA and then I would watch Raw or SmackDown, but I never really watched NXT or, but until the time when I saw Joe and Austin Aries, I believe at the time were, that left TNA and went to NXT, I kind of like paid attention to what was going on. And then when I went to NXT and like the song and the whole, like at that point, NXT, and again, it comes down to what we talked about earlier, like the timing of everything, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like the timing for me to go to NXT when I did was perfect because guys were getting called up and spots were starting to open up and they needed guys that had some in-ring experience and guys that had some, you know, uh, people recognized, so to speak, you know, um, and I just happened to step in and kind of fill those shoes immediately and got to work with all the top guys in NXT. I got to work with Finn, got to work with Nakamura, uh, before they all got called up and I just slid in there and the timing was, timing was perfect. And then the timing was right when you got called up too. I think so. Yeah. I, although I feel like on the main roster, they were trying to figure out like a tag team partner for you. You tagged with so many people. Yeah, I feel like I'm a tag team guy. I don't know, like... I don't know, you I, had a great singles career. I, I, I have, but I've also been, like, I love tag team wrestling, too. Like, I was a big tag team wrestling fan, so... I don't know. Um, a lot of people don't remember the work you did with Chad Gable. No, and th that was... Uh, Chad is so underrated, in my opinion. Like, sitting here today, I can tell you he's the one of the most underrated guys uh, in our business. He's he's phenomenal at what he does, and, and he's a natural, and he's he's... Reminds me so much of Kurt. Mm. You know, he can be, he can do anything. You know, in the ring, he can be uh, this badass, you know, uh, amateur wrestler. You know, he can come off the top rope. He can entertain you backstage. You know, he's just, he's so good. And like when Chad and I tagged together, we had a really good chemistry, but we never really seemed to do a lot on television. But when we did the live events, we had matches with uh, the Revival that were like, some of the greatest tag matches I've ever been a part of in my entire career. Mm. You know, we were going like 30, 45 minutes every night on these live events. Um, so yeah, I mean, getting a chance to work with Chad, I thought we had uh, really good chemistry, but I wish we got a chance to do a little more. Talk to me, talk to me about WrestleMania 34, making your WrestleMania debut. Yeah. And it's at a four-way match with Randy, Jinder, and Rusev. Yeah. And it's an incredible match quick i remember that um our time got cut i remember that i was it, that was a little bit disappointing um i remember our time got cut i think the girls went a little bit long but i was really just looking forward to like i'm obviously getting a chance to work and, and it was for the u.s title yeah. right so like getting a chance to 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 work with randy and who i worked with a couple months prior i think i dropped the u.s title to randy the month prior or a couple months prior in a singles match which was one of my favorite matches by the way um but yeah, getting a chance to work with all four of those guys at WrestleMania in front of 80,000 people. But the, the thing that I was looking forward to the most was my entrance. At WrestleMania. And it got cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it is what it is. But like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I can always say I, I got the opportunity to work at WrestleMania. And that was like bucket list for sure. But not an entrance. At, you didn't ever get I got I got the entrance, but it was like a quarter entrance. Like the, and I mean, the entrance way was like a mile long, yeah. of course. But like. I think I got three quarters of the way down and the next guy's music. Hit. So I didn't get to do the full yeah. glorious entrance, but it, you know, it, it's a WrestleMania. And then you're paired with Dolph yeah. and like you guys, you guys did some great stuff together because you're both so talented in the ring. And then there's the, what happens in this match with the dog food? Whew. Uh, yeah, that was, I don't know. That was a Roman Reigns thing right he was the big dog at the time wwe man <laughs> big dog needs dog food that's what that's what we got to do uh yeah so i that's i don't really remember a lot about it but i do remember the dog food and i remember it stunk <laughs> yeah that was when we were like uh corbin's heaters i think Dolph and i yeah yeah i feel like your memory is so sharp and i was actually surprised before we started rolling you were like oh yeah i get tagged and stuff when i was on twitter and yeah 
I don't even remember these matches. A lot of times I don't. Like a lot of things, I mean, they'll, I'll see something and it'll refresh my memory, but like it's not one of those things where I can, hey, oh yeah, I remember back in the day when I did this. Like I don't, I don't remember a lot of things. I'm shocked because when I saw you in Chicago, you were like, yeah, of course I remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, we, I mean, I'm, I remember faces. and We I met not great in with names, Cleveland, I believe. We did. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, was that a TNA? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I went to a show and then I went, we went out for wings afterwards, all we of did. us. Okay, see, I don't remember the wings. I just remember meeting you. And it was like yeah. you and Bully and there was a bunch of people there. Yep. And I was like eating these wings as this huge TNA fan, but also like this TV host and being like, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Like, yeah, I remember meeting you. I remember, like, I remember things. I just, when it comes to like things I've done in the business, it's just, I need a little refresher sometimes. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's because you've done so much. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I guess I've had, I mean, I've, up until now, I mean, 25 years. It's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like there's still got to be one more match. You never know. You never know. You versus never AJ would make a lot of sense. I really wanted that. I really did. Um, there was a moment in the the last Royal Rumble I did, the one in St. Louis. Um, I think I came in early, four maybe. And we had a moment. And AJ and I had a moment. And there was some rumblings, you know. People kind of remembered. Um, but it quickly went away. I got eliminated, whatever. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, yeah, I right. know, who cares? Right? Yeah. Nobody remembers that. Yeah, yeah, nobody remembers. But um, but yeah, that, that if there was one guy, I think... Yeah, it, that would make the most sense. I think there would be a story. Like, I'm a, I'm all about story. Like, there's got to be a reason, right? Yeah. Because there's got to be people who need to emotionally have to be invested in this, and they, well, I want people to care, and I want some meat on the bone there. So I think the AJ would definitely be that guy. We never had an opportunity to work in a singles match. How does AJ Styles look this great? Like, he looks the best he's ever looked his entire career now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's weird as you get older, like muscle memory. And I mean, AJ has always been in good shape. Yeah, of course. You know, like even back 2004, 2005, he was like, always looked super athletic. He always worked out. He always took care of himself. But I think now, like when, when you're in your forties, I think you just look at food differently. <laughs> you look at like training differently. You just become a little smarter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's in, he's in great shape. He looks, and Randy too. Yeah, a little bit of same. time off uh, does time wonders. off does wonders. I tell you that it really does. Like when you're on the road grinding every weekend, you know, three or four days a week, it's tough. Mm. You know, it really is, and especially when it comes to eating and sleeping and the recovery part of it. Like the recovery part of it for sure is like when you get our age, like in our, into our forties, like the recovery part of it is is everything. Yeah, you know, sleeping and um, getting treatment and whatever it takes. You know, if you if you go on no sleep, like. I need at least seven hours a night now, seven, eight hours, or I'm done. I used to wear a whoop strap. I, I noticed you're wearing the whoop. Yeah, yeah, I've had it for a year. I'm not sure if I'm going to re-up it or not. I, I uh, just I've recently decided. stopped, and it would blow my mind because I would feel rested. Yeah. And then I would look at my recovery like numbers and then be yeah. like, oh, no. Yeah, I, it blows, yeah it's same with me too, and I get mad at it. I'm, if I, I have the, like two drinks, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you're gonna have a terrible sleep tonight yeah so i think i don't know how much you drink but like if i do the same thing like if i'm sitting around and i have a couple of drinks or a couple of beers or whatever like it'll my whoop will buzz on my phone and say like high stress <laughs> like i'm not stressed i'm sitting back like having a beer like i'm there's no stress here my no, but, my resting heart rate at night would be like 50 ish okay and if i drank like let's call it like you know a handful of drinks when you're watching the game like four yeah. or five drinks sure my resting heart rate would be in the 70s Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, you're not, you're not going to have a restful sleep when your no. heart rate's that high. No, not at all. Yes, this thing's pretty incredible. It, I really like it, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, I think. Yeah. I'm with you because like once I already dialed in kind of like, if I work out this hard, the result's going to be this. If I yeah. don't drink or if I eat this type of food before bed, the result's going to be this. Once yeah. I figured that out, I'm like, I really need this thing. Same. Yeah. Same. Yeah, I'm you, with you. You figured this out. Yeah, yeah. As one of the guys in TNA and a lot of your friends are still there. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that TNA is back? I think it's great. You know, I'm happy for them. Look, it doesn't matter. Like I'm a WWE guy, of course, but I, I want to see my friends succeed. I want other companies to succeed. You know, it, it's, I do have a lot of friends still there. Eric Young is still one of my closest friends. He's still there and, and I'm happy for him. You know, Scott Demore is a guy that was, you know, one of the guys that really helped me along early in my career when I was breaking in getting me booked on a lot of independent shows in Canada. So I'm happy for him, you know, and I think uh, to see that, that 
TNA logo again is 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 great. Yeah, nostalgia is like a it's a very powerful drug. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. and I, they're they're picking up some steam, so good on them. I mean, and we see nostalgia in WWE all the time. Yep. I mean that that's what this weekend's all about. Like it really the is. Royal Rumble, we got yeah. thirty chances at that nostalgia pop. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I think that. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's like, it's totally understated how important that like nostalgia feel is. And I think that that works for a lot of characters too. Like, oh, this mm -hmm. guy reminds me a little bit of this. Yeah. And that makes me feel a certain way here. Yeah. How easy was it for you to make the transition to the producer role? Honestly, I, well, so for me, I was off for almost a year, at least a year with my, with my surgeries. So you know, I was kind of during that time after my first surgery, I was like, okay, I'm going to get through this and I'm going to be back in the ring in six, nine months. Yeah. So I'm going to be good. And then I remember going the last February going to, well, I was injured. I had my surgery in November and February was the, I believe it was a raw in Ottawa. So I drove two and a half hours to the show and see everybody. And I was there and I was like walking around ringside and thinking to myself, man, I don't know if I could do this mm. full time anymore. Like he, he, this is with the one fusion, like the one level. And I'm like, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could go out there and do this every night again. And then I saw Jason Jordan, you know, and I saw Bruce Pritchard. Bruce came up to me and he's like, Hey man, I, you know, obviously, you know, asking me how I was doing, you know, from a physical standpoint. And he's like, Hey, what, you, what have you ever thought about working as a producer? And I just, I kind of thought about it for a second and not, not at that moment with him, but I kind of walked away thinking like, yeah, mm. like I think I'd really like to do this, you know, or at least give it a shot anyways and see if I'm any good at it. Because I feel like I have a pretty good mind for the business. You know, I have, I have some good ideas and, and, and look, I still have a long way to go. I'm still learning the creative aspect of it. I think I could be a really good coach and help guys in the ring, you know, the younger guys, the younger talent coming up. I, I really like to help them with their in-ring stuff, but I really want to get good at the creative stuff, you know, and, and I'm, I, I'm good at it, but I, I'm, I want to be great at it. So, you know. Who's helping you be great at it? A lot of guys. We have a great team. Yeah, I, you know? I know I got talked to TJ and he's like crushing it as a producer. Oh my God. TJ's great. Yeah. I mean, we have a really good team, a really good core of guys. Um, but Michael Hayes is at the top of the list, you know, obviously. And I've been fortunate enough to be kind of tagged along with Michael since I started back in August as a producer. So like, and Michael is, you know, geez, I'm going to knock this microphone over. Michael is like, is like, as far as it, when it comes to producing, I mean, he's does all the main events. He's with all the top guys wow. and all the top stories. Yeah. So immediately kind of, you know, jumping into the deep end with him and yeah. just learning from him over the last, however long it's been, six, seven months, it's just, it's been incredible. And there, I mean, I still got a lot to learn, but I mean, he is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, you know, Pat Patterson and how smart he was. Yeah. And, um, you know, Michael Hayes is like the Pat Patterson of this era. Mm. He's, he's that, he's that good at what he does. So just getting to learn from him and, and learning from all the other producers, like I said, we have such a great team. TJ's one of them. Obviously he does a lot with the women, does a fantastic job with the women. Um, you know, Jamie Noble is another guy that I lean on a lot. You know, Adam Pierce is great. Um, I could sit here and name them all because we really do have a, a really, really good team. There's something about Canada that produces amazing wrestlers. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But like, I mean, when there, you look at the There's some pretty crappy ones. Too. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of evens name out. Name one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's on your Canadian Mount Rushmore? Oh. Brett would be on there for sure, obviously. Um... Edge, say, um, and there's gotta be like, I'm, I'm no, I'm going to miss somebody. This is the tough thing about Mount Rushmore. It's only, yeah, only four guys, right? Like I'm just thinking the success that these guys had and just Edge and Brett. I mean, I could say Christian too, but I know, I know I'm going to leave. I know I'm going to leave somebody out. I'm going to leave here tonight and think, oh my, why didn't I say him? But. Um, we need one more. <sighs> Jericho, maybe. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. Of course, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, no, of course, Chris. I mean, they're, they're, again, like I'm, I'm trying to think of guys that back in the day, Pat like, Patterson. Yeah, like yeah. Pat was a Canadian. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even Stu though Hart, Stu, yeah, Owen, yeah. Owen is another. Yeah, I mean, there's so many guys. Can we that, count uh, Piper. You can, yeah. He's a Winnipeg guy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's an incredible list. Yeah, a few crappy ones. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's always, it's always crap. But I know, I mean, yeah, I like, um, yeah, there's just a lot of good, it's hard to pick a, a Mount Rushmore, you know, whether it be Canadian or throughout the business. It's yeah. just very different. I mean, it's just personal opinion, I guess. Do you think there's one overarching life lesson that wrestling has taught you? To take one day at a time and, uh, you know, just, Obviously, for me, it was just trying to, you know, stay humble and always keep my ears open, always willing to learn. Um, you know, you're never, you could always be better, you know, and that you could, that kind of translates into life. You know what I mean? You can always be a better person, you know? So that's probably one of the biggest things, but biggest takeaways for sure. I love that we've been able to spend some time here. I feel like that we could talk for five more hours about everything in your yeah. career. Yeah. I end every conversation with gratitude because it's such a big part of my life. Yep. Uh, I say three things I'm grateful for when I wake up. I do it before I go to bed. And that's the question I ask every guest at the end of the interview. So what are okay. three things that you're grateful for in your life? Uh, in no particular order. Sure. Um, family, for sure. You know, um, family, definitely. You know, I, I have three boys that, you know, I know it's probably cliche, a lot of the wrestlers that, say this, but like the, your kids take a, lot, a brunt of a, a lot of things, right? Like you're not home a lot, you know? And when I was, you know, early on in my career, I was, I spent a lot of time away from home. So I missed birthdays and, and sporting events. All my kids played sports and, you know, it, it was, so I physically was never, you know, not there enough mm. in my opinion. So, you know, but they supported me and were proud of me and still proud of me. Um, so definitely family, you know, my wife, Deneen, for sure. She's my rock. Like without her, like, there's no way I would be able to do what I've done over the last few years, especially through WWE. Um, so number one is definitely family. Um, number two is health, even though like with my neck, I, that's the only surgery I've ever had in throughout a, you know, in ring 24 year in ring career. Yeah. Like, and it ultimately ended my career, you know, but I have good health, you know, and waking you up every day. Great. Yeah. I wish I looked better. <laughs> But I mean, like, like I, yeah, I mean, my health is good. Like I, sad to say, but like there's, I get text messages, it feels like every other week that, you know, somebody that I grew up with that I went to high school with or played sports with has passed away, like my age, right? It's just like, it's crazy. People dying so young and people, you know, just being grateful to wake up mm. and have my health, you know? Um, and I'm grateful for... <laughs> grateful for the business. You know what I mean? This, it's really given me a great life. Um, I didn't want to be a nine to five guy. You know, I never, I never wanted to work for the man, so to speak. Yeah. I always wanted to be some sort of pro athlete, whether, like I said, whether it be a hockey pro hockey player, whatever it may be. And, and, you know, I just, if it wasn't for the wrestling business, I'm really not sure what I'd be doing, yeah. you know? So very grateful for the, for the business for sure. I got one more for you. What's the difference between Bobby Roode and Robert Roode? I think Bobby is a little bit easier going. You know what I mean? He, he smiles once in a while where Robert is just like yeah, pompous and don't have time for anybody. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is. I mean, I, when I, I guess when I did my singles run, I guess and I did it in TNA too, right? Mm -hmm. the Robert Roode. Yeah. Just, I guess it was more of a heelish take on my character yeah being called robert bobby is more like a, it's a friendlier friendlier name i think i don't yeah. know i'm glad i got to sit down with bobby today yeah 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 thank you you're welcome no, this I was so great yeah. i really appreciate you making the time yeah no problem at all thank you